This is a review of Yu Yu Hakusho, The Spirit Detective Arc, episodes 15 through 23. This video will spoil through episode 23 of this show, so if you haven't seen up till then, do not watch this video because you will be spoiled. I think I'm in a very rare position where I don't hate any of the main characters. Don't worry, I'm just as confused as you are. But I guess I was the same way in Hunter x Hunter where everyone is cool with me and there's no reason to get riled up over hating a certain character. As it is, <laughs> this show is incredibly fast-paced and high-staked and I can really see why it was recommended to me. I really do wish that I had watched this show in my youth because I think I would have really liked it back then, especially when I was watching Dragon Ball Z. I think as a kid it wouldn't have bothered me as much that we are moving forward on the plot in such breakneck speed. All in all, I do think that it is getting so easy to watch this show because of the appreciation I can have for the utter creativity that goes into this show. It's special and unique, even with those typical shonen tropes. But, you know, to be fair, the reason why those are tropes is because they're just so entertaining. And you cannot accuse this show of not delivering on fun and action while also providing character moments. This group of episodes provided the conclusion to the Four Holy Beasts saga, I guess, and also began a new mini arc within the Spirit Detective arc. I did enjoy the Four Holy Beasts mini arc, even if its abuse of shonen tropes was particularly offensive. The overall goal was to introduce us to the main group and their strengths and their weaknesses. And it absolutely was successful in that sense because now I know what I can expect from each character in terms of fighting skills, but also in terms of interacting with other people. It solidified the relationships among the group in very simple terms. Yusuke and Kuwabara are kind of best friends. <laughs> while also competing against each other, but not really in a rivalry sense of the word. Hiei has this gentle respect for everyone in the group, even though he keeps up this front that he doesn't care about any of them. Kurama is kind of the peacekeeper among this group, not because they're not worth his time, but because he just has that cool disposition. Kuwabara and Hiei are snarky with one another, and Yusuke and Hiei have this understanding with one another, and just... All around, Yusuke is the leader of the group. So now as we move into the next arc, we have more connections to the characters and among the characters. Even someone like Botan gets to get in on the action, and she is someone who's just overall very well liked among the characters in the show. And Botan and Keiko get to be friends despite the rather rocky start to the relationship, which was based on jealousy which was based on a misunderstanding. Now that we have a basic grip of the characters and the relationships, I feel like we can go forward to the future arcs with more drama and more excitement. Instead of talking about these episodes in terms of events that happened, I want to just kind of step back and look at the individual characters, since I didn't really get a chance to do that in the previous examination of episodes. Let's start with Yusuke, of course, because He's our main character. And something that I'm already really liking about this show is how often and how badly Yusuke gets hurt. I know that sounds really weird, but I have a reason for it, because when characters get hurt, we get to see a side of them that they wouldn't normally show. For Yusuke, he started out on expert mode, because he started the series off dead, and you can't really get any worse than that, so everything since then has just pushed him to his limit each time. He's forced in every battle to reach inside of himself and pull out this strength and emotion that had been so underutilized for the first 15 years of his life. He never really tried very hard at much of anything in his life so far, but his death showed him not only how others felt about him, but how he felt about others. So Yusuke at the beginning of the series was all, I died, oh well, but now he's pulling every trick out of his bag to try to help not only people around him, but himself. He's so charming that it's easy to care about him and want him to succeed and hope that he does well. Kuwabara, meanwhile, is kind of a huge doofus, and he keeps inviting himself on every 
little trip that they have to take. But he invited himself on the rescue Yukina trip because apparently, in addition to being a shithead who loves animals and his friends, he also is a hopeless romantic. I kind of like that everything he does is self-taught and it makes you wonder how good he'd be if someone was actually guiding him. Considering he always puts a thousand percent into everything that he does, I don't really see the loss in training him to become an actual spirit detective. He's great because he sees everything in black and white terms where he's either gonna walk away unaffected or he's gonna work harder than anyone else there. I think in my previous review I was very harsh towards Kuwabara because I felt like they were trying to manipulate me into liking him. But maybe it's just because he actually does tick off everything on my list of being an awesome sidekick character that my brain can't really comprehend the utter perfection that is before me. Either way, I've moved past this indifference and I enjoy Kuwabara as a character to the extent in which I think I have to revise my top 10 anime boyfriends list. Now, I was like, meh, when it came to Hie, and I was like, meh when it came to Yukina. But then I found out that she's his sister and I was like, OMG! I can't think of anything that's more redemptive than rescuing your baby sister from an evil crime lord. So I can see why he was given this subplot. It almost makes him lovable in a way. I don't even care how little sense it makes because it's so precious. I felt like Hiei's character evolution was handled a little bit rushed it, because over the course of less than a day, I feel he was beginning to change his evil ways from Yusuke's influence. But Kurama did mention that it did seem very subconscious what Hiei was going through, so maybe Hiei isn't really even aware that he is changing. At the gateway of betrayal, Yusuke trusted Hiei to rescue them, even though he really had no reason to do so, considering Hiei had just finished telling them that he couldn't wait to betray them. That notion of total unconditional trust must have been exactly what Hiei needed for his brain to just kind of click and go, bro, there's another way. It's not very difficult to make the comparison to Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z because of, you know, the enemy to ally and the height and the hair shape. So I do hope that he deviates from that path because as it is, I, I'm too distracted by the similarities to appreciate him as a character. Everyone loves a good turnaround character because they can be mean and dickish among a group that's so noble and righteous. And I think we need that in this particular group considering how noble and righteous they all are. I have less to say about Kurama because relative to the others he had less to do because he didn't join them on the rescue mission. His shtick is that he's smooth and suave and kind of ladylike in a way. Personally, those type of attributes don't really do it for me, but I can see why he'd be very appealing among the ladies. Now it seems like he's just straight up working for Koenma and I can respect the decision to make him hang back so that it can be all about Hiei. But maybe Kurama peaked too early when his uh, introduction arc he was trying to sacrifice himself to save his human mother, and um, there's just, you can't get more dramatic than that. But then again, I get the sense that there's a lot more to offer, because there is that whole non-human aspect of him. From how Hiei talked about him, I expected so much more from his fighting skills, but that might just be because he's in the confines of a human shell or something. He took human form in order to hide and gather strength, so can I assume that there's a demon form to look forward to? I don't dislike Kurama at all, but I do consider him the least interesting among the group based on what we've seen so far. Though I do love it when I'm proven wrong, especially when I flippantly judge people in my reviews. So bring it on, Kurama. Show me how interesting you are. When it comes to Botan, I didn't feel strongly about her really at all. But when she rescued Keiko, suddenly I was like, yeah! Especially when she took that metal pole to the face. Botan is confusing for me because she acts like she's gonna be that helpless and pointless girl, but then all of a sudden she's like really useful and actually kicks some ass. But in this show, she is 
liked by all the characters, and she plays the straight man in an environment where everyone is over the top and wacky. I like that she cleared the air with Keiko, even though now their friendship is kind of based on a foundation of lies. I really hope that doesn't have to be addressed later on, because I kind of like where Keiko is in the show, and I don't need her to be involved any further. I don't mind her where she is, but I think that if she was to have a larger role in the show, she might wear on my spine a bit. But just keep in mind that I'm incredibly sexist when it comes to anime characters. I really don't like women for the most part. It's weird to say, isn't it? I don't mind damsel in distress characters, as long as it's established early on that that's what they are. Though to be fair to Keiko, it's not as if she is a damsel in distress character, because she did prove early on that she has some smarts and some guts, and she rescued Yusuke from a burning building! Remember that? Given the circumstances, she's fared a hell of a lot better than I would have in her situation. The only other real reoccurring character in the show is Koenma, but there's not much to say about him. <laughs> Every time we change scenes and go to him to see what he's up to, he's always doing something pointless, like trying to find the remote, or eating some lunch, or reading the wrong book, so he has to order off spankings for his demons. <laughs> he's kind of an idiot, but I think that if he wasn't incredibly stupid, then he'd be much more difficult to like, in a way. As he is, he's just kind of this guy fumbling around in a job that he's not really qualified for. Though that opening sequence in the videotape that he made was pretty funny. Or maybe it was just the existence of videotapes in general that was pretty funny. That in payphones. Remember payphones? Anyway, it is crazy to me that this arc is going to be wrapped up in two more episodes because we still have to fight those three guys. And then we have to fight those two guys. And um, then we need a conclusion. And that's going to happen in two episodes. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm going to go into this not expecting anything because this author has the ability to surprise me with how he tends to wrap up his arcs. Basically every arc in Hunter x Hunter ended in a way that I did not anticipate. Next up I'm watching episodes 24 and 25 in order to finish off this arc and then I'll be watching the first two episodes of the next arc, the uh, Dark Tournament arc. And I don't imagine I'm gonna have a lot to complain about in like a 40 episode long arc all about a tournament. <laughs> See you all next time and let me know if my dark tournament arc schedule looks good. Bye! That notion of unconditional trust may have been exactly what Hiei needed for his blame, blame his brain. <laughs>